it's very often helpful to look at poetry in terms of a kind of balance of opposites between the negative elements of the poem and the, the positive ones. So I'd like to look at Keats's Ode to a Nightingale from that point of view. Let's start just by taking a close look at the first stanza of the poem. My heart aches and a drowsy numbness pains my sense as though of hemlock I had drunk or emptied some dull opiate to the drains one minute past and leafy woods had sunk. It is not through envy of thy happy lot but being too happy in thine happiness, that thou, light-winged dryad of the trees, in some melodious plot of beech and green and shadows numberless, singest of summer in full-throated ease. So there's a very clear contrast going on here between the negative words in the first part of that opening stanza and the positive words in the second half. More than that, though, we can say that the negative words all relate to the poet, whereas the positive words all relate to the nightingale. But it goes even further than that. We can see some very, very specific contrasts between these two groups of words. The most basic contrast is perhaps between the word pains in the first part contrasted with the word ease in the second half. And we can see other contrasts, dull and light. Emptied and full. Dryad, representing the spirit, and sense, the world of the physical body. And, no doubt, we could find many others. But let's move on here and take a look at the second and third stanzas of the poem. Oh, for a draught of vintage that hath been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth, tasting of flora and the country green, dance and Provençal song and sunburnt mirth. Oh, for a beaker full of the warm south, full of the true, the blushful hippocrene, with beaded bubbles winking at the brim and purple-stained mouth, that I might drink and leave the world unseen, and with thee fade away into the forest dim. Fade far away, dissolve and quite forget, what thou among the leaves hast never known, the weariness, the fever, and the fret, here where men sit and hear each other groan, where palsy shakes a few sad last grey hairs, where youth grows pale and spectre thin and dies, where but to think is to be full of sorrow and leaden-eyed despairs, where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes, or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow. So again, we've got a clear distinction between the positive side of the poem and the negative side. This time, though, it's not just the nightingale and the poet that are contrasted. The nightingale is a summer visitor to England, coming from the south, from Africa, up through France. And the poet imagines the world of the nightingale and contrasts it here with the world of the poet. I've picked out the word mirth from the second stanza and sorrow from the third stanza as representing what seems to me to be the central opposition or contrast between these two stanzas. But just as in the first stanza, we've got some very specific contrasts and oppositions going on here. The dance and song of the world of the nightingale contrasts specifically with the world of the poet where men sit and hear each other groan. Equally, the world of the nightingale is a colourful world with its green and its purple. And this again sits in specific contrast with the world of the poet, which is grey and pale. As a final example, we could look at the temperatures in the two stanzas 
in the world of the nightingale, the wine is cooled. It's a, a beaker full of the warm south. Whereas in the world of the poet, we have the uncomfortable temperature, the fever. And again, I'm just scratching the surface here. You could find many other examples if you looked at those two stanzas carefully. So take a look for yourself and see what you can find. In the fourth stanza, the poet now leaves behind his world of sorrow and misery, and in his imagination he enters the world of the nightingale. And here the pattern that we've seen so far of positive and negative begins to break down slightly. Away, away, for I will fly to thee, not charioted by Bacchus and his pards, but on the viewless wings of poesy, though the dull brain perplexes and retards. Already with thee, tender is the night, and haply the queen moon is on her throne, clustered around by all her starry fays. But here there is no light, save what from heaven is with the breezes blown through verdurous glooms and winding mossy ways. In this stanza, the positive and negative aspects don't correspond quite so neatly with the poet and the nightingale. We get some of what we expect with, for example, tender, connecting clearly with the nightingale and the dull brain that perplexes and retards connecting with the poet. But it isn't all quite like that. The poet will fly to the nightingale. So a positive quality gets connected to the poet. And the world of the nightingale is a world of no light, a world of glooms. From that point of view, the central image of this stanza is perhaps the image of the viewless wings of poesy. This image unites the poet and the nightingale. Through poesy, or poetry, the poet can enter the world of the nightingale and be together with the nightingale. So now the poet enters imaginatively into the world of the nightingale. It's a world of darkness, a nighttime world, so he can't see it, but instead imagines what it might be like. I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs, but in embalmed darkness guess each sweet wherewith the seasonable month endows the grass, the thicket, and the fruit tree wild, white hawthorn, and the pastoral eglantine, fast fading violets covered up in leaves, and mid May's eldest child, the coming musk rose, full of dewy wine, the murmurous haunt of flies on summer eves. So now all of this is the world of the nightingale, or at least how the poet imagines the world of the nightingale. And it's worth noting that along with the positive imagery, there are some uncomfortable images, not entirely negative perhaps, but tending towards the negative side. This blurring of positive and negative becomes even more evident in the sixth stanza, where the poet imagines that he could escape his world of misery and pain forever by simply dying, dying right at that moment as he listens to the song of the nightingale. Darkling I listen, and for many a time I have been half in love with easeful death, called him soft names in many a mused rhyme to take into the air my quiet breath. Now, more than ever seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain, while thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy. Still wouldst thou sing, and I have ears in vain, to thy high requiem become a sod. So we've got what is possibly the biggest opposition imaginable, the opposition between death and love. But Keats doesn't emphasize the opposition. He's half in love with easeful death. And he uses a whole range of words 
to try to make death seem attractive and positive. We may feel it's a bit strange that death comes into the ideal world of the nightingale, but when we consider that for Keats, death is an escape from the pain and suffering of this world, it makes a kind of sense. But there's something else that Keats finds in the world of the nightingale, something that breaks the spell and brings him back to the real world. Before we go on to the last two stanzas, let's just take a look at what we've got so far. There's a basic opposition between happiness and sorrow, with the nightingale representing the world of the spirit and imagination on the side of happiness, and the poet representing the world of sense, the world of reality, on the side of sorrow. Thou wast not born for death, immortal bird, O hungry generations, tread thee down. The voice I hear this parting night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown. Perhaps the self-same song that found a path through the sad heart of Ruth when, sick for home, she stood in tears amid the alien corn. The same that oft times hath charmed magic casements opening on the foam of perilous seas in fairy lands forlorn. So what's happening here is that even in the world of the nightingale, the poet finds sadness, sickness, peril. The fairy lands are forlorn. The world of the nightingale has its own unhappiness. It has its own suffering. Keats cannot escape from the suffering and pain of his world by going into the world of the nightingale. Forlorn. The very word is like a bell to toll me back from thee to my soul self. Adieu. The fancy cannot cheat so well as she is famed to do, deceiving elf. Adieu, adieu. Thy plaintive anthem fades, past the near meadows, over the still stream, up the hillside, and now tis buried deep in the next valley glades. Was it a vision or a waking dream? Fled is that music. Do I wake or sleep? And so, as the bird flies away, the poet is left in a state of confusion. What was that? What happened? 